back to the second day of our, our conference of the World uh, Humanities Forum, the Fifth World Humanities Forum. It's my pleasure today to introduce our, our third keynote speaker, Professor Wang Hui from Tsinghua University in Beijing, China. Uh, professor Wang Hui is a distinguished professor of arts, humanities, and social sciences at Tsinghua University, and also a Changjiang scholar and director of the Tsinghua Institute for Advanced Studies in Humanities and Social Sciences. He started his career as a scholar in modern Chinese literature, especially Lu Xun studies, and then moved to the Chinese intellectual history after earning his PhD in 1988 at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. From 1996 to 1990 to 2007, he served as the co-editor of Du Xu magazine and organized a series of significant intellectual debates in China. His fields are Chinese intellectual history, modern Chinese literature, and social theory, among others. His publications include The Rise of Modern Chinese Thought, a four-volume work that was published between 2004 and 2009, The Depolit uh, Depoliticized Politics, published in 2008, from Asian Perspective, Narrations of Chinese History, published in 2010, The Short 20th Century Chinese Revolution and the Logic of Politics, published in 2015. He's also the winner of several prizes, including the 2013 Luca Pacioli Prize and the 2018 Annalise Meyer Research Award. His presentation today is entitled, Missions and Challenges of Humanities in Contemporary Context from a Chinese Perspective. Please join me in welcoming Professor Wang Hui, our keynote speaker. Good morning. Uh, so, uh, since we have only 20 minutes, I will directly go to the talk. And uh, uh, I would like to talk something about the challenges and the missions of con uh, the, the humanities in contemporary contexts, but mainly from the perspective and especially the historical vision uh, in China. So that's the, uh, the, uh, my talk. Uh, let me talk about these, the, the four characteristics of humanities in shaping in the whole 20th century. I think that the historical conditions of humanities that took shape during that time. And my basic argument is these four historic conditions or the characteristics of humanities nowadays fundamentally transformed. We need to rethink about what humanity should do. So the modern humanities formed as the, the first, I think, formed as a theology, Confucian classics, lost sacredness and hegemony. Generally speaking, its values are post-theology and post-classics, namely the secular or vernacular values of man, though the term secular itself in these contexts is problematic because in Chinese context, how to use the secular or the binary between the religious and the secular is a big issue, but we, I will explain it a little bit later. The second, the characteristics of modern humanities in China is modern humanities generated in a clash between the so-called East and the West, and in the formation of nation states. So the humanities were in that in the 19th and the 20th, especially 20th century, especially I think in the fields of the human, in the history, literature, and the philosophy, they all shaped by the idea of national knowledge too. So its disciplines were set up under the influence of European and American universities and in connection with the self-narrative of nation state. So it's interaction on the one hand, in deeply influenced by the Western knowledge, but on the other hand, it's connected with the self-narrative of nation state. Third characteristics, the modern humanities was born in a competition with science for the hegemony influenced by the modern scientific methodology and at the same time attempting to prove its autonomous position that differs from science and its methodology. 
So on the one hand, the humanity is trying to struggle for its position in the new institutions, including the universities, with the science technology. But on the other hand, deeply influenced, reshaped by the science and the technology. So this is the third one. The fourth characteristic, I think, it's a modern humanities and the generation uh, of the intelligentsia interacted intimately with each other. Specialized academic research and the moments of thought and the culture inspire the budgets each other. So the so humanities and the humanist thought was not only shaped within the context of the university or the disciplinary thinking, but also a certain kind of the cultural moments or the intellectual moments with interact with these kind of the certain knowledge. So in that sense, the intellectual moments itself trans or the trans uh, tr transcend the, cro uh, the boundaries of different disciplines in that context. So these four conditions, I think now transformed, I will uh, come back to these basic arguments by the end of my talk. Here I will do some the historical analysis. So first, first of all, we need to think about the multiple traditions of humanities. The multiple tradition, when I talk about the traditions, not necessarily these kind of tradition not cannot simply be defined naturally as a humanities. However, that provides the real resources for the modern uh, the humanities. Let me think about that. It, I, I, here, I cite the Jacques Derrida's arguments. If it's because he came to Dojo Magazine. We have the round table discussion with him just before the September 11, 2001, days before we had the discussion. I invite him to give the talk on the uni university and the humanities. So his basic argument is that in principle, the university ought to be a site where questions regarding truth, the nature of man, humanity, and the history of mankind, and also so on, should be raised with independence and without condition, namely the place where one can unconditionally resist and differ. So the, hum the inquiry without condition, the major impetus for the humanities to separate from the theological world, the humanities is the soul of the university. So we can also find the same, the, the inspirations from Chinese traditions. Here, at least here, come from Confucius to the Sima Qian, the thinking about the boundary of the knowledge and the so on and so forth. So, here, I try to list some historical traditions of the university in China, which is not the uni modern university, but we can find the resources from there. The one is the, the uh, Taishu. It's in the 135 BC, Emperor Wu had an imperial academy built in the capital Chang'an, established a position for erudits of the five classics and enrolled 50 disciples of erudits. The later historical periods, the subjects studied in the Imperial Academy expanded. So here, the, this is the first official institution for the study and a certain kind of division of the knowledge based on the classical studies. I think that the second, even more important tradition is a so-called private learning is contrast with the official education system often traced back to the spring and autumn period when the Confucian uh, moist, doist, legalist learnings were most influential. The legacy of the four major academics founded in the early Song Dynasty served as models for later academics, uh, uh, the Bai Lu Dong, and all these kind of the private uh, that we, we call it in Chinese is a shu yuan, you know, this is the, the kind of the one most prominent distinction from the official learning system. So these are 
second resources for reintegrated into the modern the system of education. The third one, I think, is the forms of private teachings, theoretical uh, debates, and the inter-schools academic debates. That's the, from the, the subjects, the, the, from classic history, literature, and the poetry, the Taoism, erudition in things or phenomena, law and the politics, and so on and so forth. That can be traced back to the long history. It's a kind of the certain kind of the public platform for the debates and the discussions. These were interacted with the, like a Buddhist uh, debates. The, even in the modern era, after the examination systems was abandoned, the legacy of private learning not only merged into the university system, but also played a significant role in the devel development of local educational practice, in particular, the development of the teachers' college, agriculture schools, and the engineering schools. So merged into that traditions. And the, according to, the, especially after the Tang Dynasty, that the, the great Tang Dynasty record of the Western regions by Xuanzang notes that the Nalanda Mahavihara temple, we know that there was a, established a new university, was a center for the scholarship with about 1,500 teachers, where over 10,000 monks, including Xuanzang, Yijin, and others from China. So that was not in, inside of China, but in India. However, you can find these kind of the intact outside of the tradition of the Western traditions. It's really in China, India, and, and Asia, a certain kind of the free debates in that kind of the context. And uh, that's, that's why from the late 19th century, early 20th century, some scholars, intellectuals try to revisit that tradition to think about what is the new pub public space for the debate and the discussion and the survey for uh, the reading, rereading of the classics. So in the tradition of the learning explication and the debating in the Buddhism converged with the classical tradition of private learning in China and significantly influenced the formation of academies in the Song Dynasty after the 10th centuries. So here, of course, there was a very important tradition. With now in, in China, we still have the national examination system for enrolling students from every year that kind of the long tra national examination tradition can be traced back very early. So here I list from the Sui Dynasty, formalized in the Song Dynasty. 18th century European Enlightenment scholars celebrated the relative transparency, fairness, and the justice of the examination system in China as it replaced aristocratic systems of the selection by inheritance, selection by recommendation, or the nine grade control the system for selecting officials. So in a long historical period, the official system of education and the private learning were both connected with the examination system in complex ways here. So however, all these were only the traditions. Now we need to think about that. Now we talk about the humanities is a very special the fields within the framework of the modern university. So here, the, 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 we, we talk about the birth of the university. The uh, Beiyang Naval School established in August 1881, for example, that the Western style, the universities. So it is a very interesting because these were contrasts with the enlightenment in the West. Here, the key issue is the salvation and the survival of the nation, the old in the last dynasties. Here is the Yan Fu. Later, he became the, the, the president of the Peking University. So, and uh, which means that the, uh, that kind of the new university focused on the technology, especially the military technology, rather than the humanities. So this is the beginning. It's not the mission was not for the inquiry without condition, but try to develop the new technology to defend 
China at that time. So the, the, the new system of education was not the result of the Enlightenment as the event in European history, but originated from the need for modern military technology. But later, of course, Capital University, that it's the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the so-called modern this is a Beijing University, the established. In there, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the national learning as the substance, Western learning, the function, use the national and uh, Western learning together to observe their ways of the operation. So basically, you can see that uh, it's still not the clear, the clear definition between the, the humanities, science, and so on and so forth. And they try to organize a hierarchical totality of knowledge within the subtle division from within. So that's the early the, the, uh, uh, situation. I will uh, space of, of these. And after the, uh, the, from the early uh, 20th century down to the May 4th Enlightenment, the most important thing is the so-called East-West civilization de uh, debate. But that kind of debate between the East and the West civilizations gradually reorganized into the taxonomy of the knowledge. So the science and the humanities. So the, that was the birth of the humanities close linked to the debates between the Eastern and the West civilization debates. So these are uh, the, 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 the basic the issues. The birth of the modern university was closely linked with the science and technology and the formation of the disciplines was also inseparable from the notion of science. And the science, of course, is came from, the, the translation came from the, the Japan, Minji Japan. With these are uh, the basic issues. Here, I, I will, uh, like, because we have no time to <laughs> talk so much on these kind of the, uh, the detailed discussion. But basically, I think that the two debates and the problem of the knowledge, the debate over the Eastern and the Western civilizations, and the, and the debate of the, uh, between the different uh, knowledge. I hear, I cited the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Liang Zhuming's arguments because Eastern civilization means metaphysics, art, open metaphysical talk, uh, nominal private morality return to the past. That's the, the Indian Chinese tradition for him. That the Western civilization means the science, learning, knowledge, ethics, phenomena, public morality, modernization, the first direction, the Western roads. So you see that the debates between the civilizations within China and uh, gradually became the uh, divisions between the knowledges. So here, that's the uh, transformation of, of these. So scientific civilizations, metaphysical civilizations, and uh, so, so on and so forth. So that was gradually, these kind of so-called rational division of the knowledge reorganized into the division of knowledge within the universities after the 1920s here. So I will have no time uh, to, to talk on these issues. Basically, I will argue that uh, the, the basic challenge, I may go back to the, uh, 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 I think this is, Here, uh, and also we, we need to, to, to remember that in, the China, in China we have the completely different techno taxonomy of knowledge before the 20th century. And all these different knowledge are reorganized according to the modern disciplines came from the Western ideas, reorganized in the formation of the, uh, the, the uh, different disciplines. So these are the traditional uh, uh, taxonomies here. Uh, the literature, philosophy, history, and all these disciplines, even the term self, had a completely different connotation from nowadays. This is a very different issues. So here I summarized the, uh, the, the last, I come to the conclusion of, of these. Uh, 
First, is confronted with the globalization and the regionalization. The substance and the division of humanities will need to readjust. The hence, the following questions. How to evaluate the disciplinary division of contemporary humanities? How could we take the relationship of humanity, uh, uh, of the disciplines of humanities with different traditions of humanities into account? Because the modern knowledge was really came dominated by the idea of the Western humanities. How can in the globalization, how different kind of the traditions can be recount? The second economic globalization has not led to the absolute disenchanted world. On the contrary, as secular life prospered, so-called secular, <laughs> so-called I, religion and the diverse traditions also seem to revive. How should we de redefine the mission of humanities in these contexts? Which means that the how to redefine, understand the tradition of enlightenment in the contemporary context. Here now in China, we had a long debates about the role of male force of enlightenment nowadays. So these are, are the second question. The third one is the position of contemporary humanities came into being in its connection as well as separation from the natural sciences. As the development of the artificial intelligence, genetic technology, ecological science, and, and so on and so forth is impacting the way hum of human life both mentally and physically. Given the current situation of disciplinary demarcation, how could we redefine the relationship between the humanities and the natural sciences? How could the humanities draw strength from development of natural sciences while remain capable of reflecting critically on such developments? So these are kind of the new mission, redefine the relationship be hum between the humanities and the sci natural science. I think now the urgent issue. Two, digital technology has significantly changed the field and the borders of humanities research. Translingual, transregional, and the transcultural research has stepped into a new era as a result how should we reevaluate the humanities in the digital era? As the academic disciplines are highly specialized now, how can humanities and education in humanities became, become the origin of new thinking? How to reform the intelligentsia in a world of specialization and the marketization? Because we know that the real strengths of the new ideas, not simply came from disciplinary research, but also the interacting between the different worlds. So there were certain kind of the intellectual or thought moments there. But now we, are, we still see some discussions, but most of them were the strategic, tactic thinking about the, how to deal with the challenges of globalization and so on and so forth. It's very different from like the, the early 20th century. The people try to stay back to think about the, culture, about the current situation culturally. So that's another kind of the, uh, the, the, the challenge. Thank you so much.